one. <laughs> in antisocial behavior, so housing related crime and antisocial behavior. So in every year jurisdiction, it's called different. different. So it's called like incivility, it's called your blind offenses. You sometimes find in South Africa just called crime. <laughs> Drug dealing, intimidating behavior, noise nuisance. Most, some of the people are mentally ill, some are addicted, some are both. So that type of person. So my, my paper is called Mainstreaming TJ in Civil Court. So now there is a whole project of mainstreaming therapeutic jurisprudence in just mainstream courts. So not specific problem solving work, but just ordinary courts. And I want to tell you something about the project I'm involved in civil law. So not criminal courts, so we're talking about this housing related crime and civil courts and how to use and apply TJ in that type of law. So neighbors in the modern city line. So there's in, in a lot of countries there is a process of urbanization and population growth. So there are more people that live together, more neighbors, and that really there's a lot of research affects the quality of life. So people know each other, <coughs> everywhere in the world people know each other. That's a great thing about this topic. I can travel a lot because everywhere I can study this problem, everywhere in the townships of, of your, in, in Cape Town, people know each other. In New York City, people know each other. And there is always, so this housing and crime is always related. It's an interesting topic. So in the Netherlands, uh, where I'm going to talk about uh, today, um, this problem with crime, housing related crime, it's not dealt with criminal law. So criminal law doesn't take, take care about that. So, most of these problems are taking uh, or are, are addressed with private law, so tenancy law. And that's something specific, I guess, from the Netherlands, but I know that in other jurisdictions this can be seen as well, this tenancy, because local authorities, police, are trying to escape criminal law and trying to escape procedural safeguards. So they use administrative law, private law, to address these problems. In the Netherlands, um, Almost 40% of people live in public housing, so that's you know, it's there, there. So it's not really like governmental, like council states, but they're big housing associations. They used to be public housing associations. They are privatized, but still really regulated by government, and they have all kind of statutory obligations to house people. And still, 40% of the population live in this. In this and they, you, they use, so they're the main actors to address crime, housing related crime. So drug dealing, uh, production of, of drugs, so cannabis growing, growing hemp in, in homes is a big problem in the Netherlands. Uh, noise nuisance, like multi-problem families, they're all addressed with private tenancy. So they're all interesting uh, procedural things about it. So uh, is how, how about their rights, how about their right to housing, right to a home. Um, but today I'm going to tell you something about how to implement TJ in that procedure. So, almost 1,500 families are evicted each year because of antisocial behavior in the Netherlands. So that's five a day. Um, and there are millions of complaints in the Netherlands about housing related. So not every case is dealt with eviction. There are a lot of cases that are just in the process somewhere we don't know where. So what I try to do, what I try to do is to use and apply TJ oriented techniques in this housing court, and we managed to start a project, and we already have 54 cases. So I'm telling you something about that. So what's the problem? How we managed to to do the project, and what's the, what are the lessons learned from mainstreaming TJ in a civil law context? So how does, how does the traditional approach, uh, not the TJ approach, look like? So how do we tackle these neighbors from hell? So basically there are three stages. So there's a pre-legal stage, a pre-trial stage, and a court stage. So in the first pre-legal stage, the problem arises, and then neighbors try to talk to each other. They try to solve their own problem. So if they don't manage to do so, they go to like all kinds of neighborhood mediation projects, there's a mediation, they're sponsored by government, and in, in some cases they manage to solve the problem. But in a lot of cases they don't manage to solve the problem. There's a lot of research about that. In only three out of ten cases, mediation is working. So in most cases, 
Mediation isn't working. Why? Because mediation is not available in some, in some municipalities. So that's just a practical problem. We can make it available, but there are other reasons. Mediation is not available if one of if the offender is aggressive, drug addicted, or mentally ill. So they don't send volunteers to those people. So it's not available. The biggest reason why it's not working is because, of, and that's that's been researched by social scientists, like psychologists and sociologists, because they're so they're the conflict is asymmetrical. So they're they're both sides. Um, so one side, so the victim, really wants to solve the problem. But the offender doesn't want to solve the problem at all. So he just doesn't want to participate in this mediation procedure. So if that happens, we go to the second stage. That second stage is it's just waiting. Till the antisocial behavior is so serious that we can go to the third stage. So the third stage is a big issue. So Landlords go to the court, so the housing associations go to the court, so 1,500 cases a year. They have to prove that there's a breach of the lease, and that the breach of the lease is serious enough to evict this, this family or this tenant. So they manage to do so in 1,500 cases. But remember, like 10% of the Dutch population in a big uh, statistical research, so they questioned around, or they asked around 72,000 people. <clears throat> so, uh, do you suffer from antisocial behavior from your neighbors? 10% said, yes, I suffer from antisocial behavior from my neighbors on a daily basis and it's really serious. So, 10%. And there are only 1,500 cases in this court stage. So, there's a big gap somewhere. Some cases are, are gone. So, there are, most of them are in this middle stage. So, there are a number, if you look at this through a TJ lens, there are a number of problems. So, first, our main focus is how to get the people evicted. So an eviction is, it does not have any therapeutic effect, according to me. It just displays the problem, it aggravates the problem. Making people homeless is not a great solution for, their, for the underlying problem, so I don't think there's any discussion in that. But also for the victim, it's not a great solution. So of course it sounds like a main tough approach. So we're going to evict you, or we're going to evict the offender if he's antisocial. But then we did, I did a statistical analysis um, on around 600 of these cases, together with economic. And then we managed to find out so how long does it take if the problem starts <coughs> to the court stage. So noise nuisance, for example. Any clue? How long does it take? Three years. Three years. It's yeah. six years. Oh God. So that's just horrible. And then there are also cases. So we found a case of 32 years. What's interesting, drug-related crime, if you grow cannabis inside your home, that's a big problem in the Netherlands. So we have this coffee shop. They need to have, they need to have drugs, so they need to have a stash. Uh, but it's not, you're not allowed to grow cannabis in the land, so it's just a weird thing. <laughs> <laughs> so there's all this illegal substructure, and people just grow cannabis, and there are gangs, of course, that force vulnerable people to grow cannabis inside their own home. It causes a fire hazard, of course, it causes, it, it, it's not great for quality of life, but if you're getting caught by this, by, with your own cannabis plan, it takes only a half year, maximum, and you're a victim. So that's strange, right? So if your coast is your neighbor from hell, it takes like six years, and then it's a big thing you displace from. If you grow cannabis, it's just a half year, and then the problem is also aggravated. So it's a different uh, story. But from a TJ perspective, this this isn't working. It's also a really expensive system approach because we just collect a lot of evidence during the waiting stage, and then we evict people and displace the problem, and the problem starts all over again. So my idea was to, to use TJ uh, to, to see whether we can improve this, this approach. Improve it for both the victim as the offender. So now I applied this uh, methodology developed by Professor Wexler uh, with bottles and wine. So he says first you need to analyze the legal framework. Is this problem caused by the legal framework? For example, is it mandatory under Dutch law? to request an eviction order or not. And secondly, if, if, if the framework seems receptive to TJ, then you need to see 
or you need to find out which techniques you need to apply in this legal framework to improve this, 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 this approach. So when we analyze the legal structure, we find out that it's not mandatory at all to repress the eviction. Um, they repress the eviction orders because they're used to it. If you go to, go to the website of the Dutch judiciary, you publish almost every case online. When you, when you type in antisocial behavior, you will only find eviction cases. So lawyers come from law school, they have this case, they Google antisocial behavior on this website, they find eviction cases, and they just do whatever what every other lawyer has done before. So that's one. So, and if you look at all the card guidelines and just books, it's all about if there's antisocial behavior, you have to evict them. And the, the test, or you have to prove that there's serious antisocial behavior. But then we find out that it's also possible to, um, to, to request the court to issue the behavioral order. Basically what the court does is, is, is order the tenant to comply with the lease, with its obligations from the lease. You have to behave like a social tenant or a prudent tenant. So you can ask the court to, for example, uh, oblige people to follow a specific course, like an anger management course, or to get rid of his dog or to give them an, an, an order not to have like parties all night long every day. <laughs> so what we find out, the bottles are quite receptive, so the legal framework is quite receptive. So we don't need to change anything for, uh, uh, in, the legal, in the legal structure. So now the only need, the thing we need to do is pouring wine into these bottles, pouring TJ or intended wine in these bottles. So, when you look at all the TJ literature, there, there are a lot of TJ techniques. But what we find interesting is, we need to, the, the intervention should be early. When neighbors are not already upset and don't want to talk to, or talk to each other. So we need to focus on underlying problem. There is this notion of literature concerning antisocial behavior and underlying problems with it. So it most has to do with mental illness, drug addiction, other substance abuse, uh, a social network which is dysfunctioning, poverty. If people have a lot of spare time, if they don't have a job, they have a lot of time to be antisocial and annoy their neighbor. But also victims, if victims have a lot, a lot of time, they have a lot of time to be annoyed. Uh, um, so you need to use the network of victim and offender you need to promote dialogue between victims and offenders, and compliance monitoring is key. So in, in the Dutch system, so the traditional system, we don't use the court in a really smart way. So in the end, you'll see a judge once, and he basically has to decide whether you're evicted or not. And then most of the time, like in 70%, he will evict you, and you'll never see the court again. And we don't know what happened with the, with the evict. So if you look, and I make this a little bit bigger, so it's not that the court stage is the most important, but there are a lot more words in this in this third stage, so that's why it's a little bit bigger, but uh, to, to, make, to make you able to, to, to read. So still there's the free legal stage, mediation, so we really promote people to use mediation, neighborhood mediation, the techniques here. Um, then there's the pre-trial stage, where we want to intervene really quickly. So if we see... That, that people are not able to solve the problem together, we are already going to intervene over here. So we're not going to wait for six years before we go to court. We're going to request court to issue a behavioral order. And we let people know that we're going to court and that their behavior has consequences for them. So at court, um, we use all kinds of techniques. So judicial negotiation, mediation, facilitation of dialogue, problem solving. We're going to ask behavioral orders or eviction, and ask the court to, co to monitor the compliance with this order. So what we basically do is go to court in an early stage and request court not to evict them, but to issue a behavioral order. At court stage, the, co the judge is going to ask and use motivational interviewing techniques and see whether the tenants and the victims are still able to reach an agreement. And we make an agreement at the, at the court itself, so like a contract which is an additional, which is added to the traditional lease, and we ask the court to wait and postpone the case for, for three months, six months, or a year. 
to see whether the tenant complies with this new contract. If not, he's got, he, can, he can issue an eviction order or uh, a misbehavioral order. So this, this, this is up to you. So lessons learned. What's, what needs to be done if you want to apply TJ in this mainstream court, you need to build a coalition. We're quite successful. We require funding from the national government and local government. We found 34 housing associations from all over the country to be involved, and the umbrella organizations of all housing organizations. So we had this big pilot group. We had a big crime prevention NGO on board who organized all kinds of conferences and wanted to, to write a guide with us. We had all mental health care agencies uh, active in the whole project. We had the local police and 10 law firms and numerous judges um, working with, this, with us in expert meetings and conference. So we had around like 20 conferences with 100 <coughs> employees of housing associations. So we reached around 2,000 people and tell them and, and develop this, this TJ orientated approach. So we made a nice looking god. So we call it, this is Dutch for behavioral order. And then it says tackling antisocial behavior effectively in ten tendency law. So there was this, so this is a hoarder. People who collect a lot of stuff. <laughs> uh, this is not a hoarder, this is one someone from the housing. Uh, so. <laughs> so I have horrible. <laughs> so we made this, this new guy. But it's in Dutch, but I can provide you with that. So it's really nice looking with non legal words and a lot of uh, visualization as well. So a lesson learned number two you need to create a narrative. That's really important to, uh, to uh, there should be something in it for everyone. So if you want to apply TJ in this mainstream court, you make, make, to make sure that everyone thinks there's something in it for me. So we made sure that we said this approach is better for the victims. We always start with that. So we don't want to be seen as the project is, oh, they're, the, the, they're only there for the offenders. We don't, they don't want the offender to be a victim because then we're seen as like a softy approach. Maybe we are, but that's why we start with the victims. We say, victims have to wait for six years right now. That's horrible. 